Today, COVID news makes you almost think like it's July 2020. Cases are rising, hospitalizations are up, the mask debate is hot. But why does it seem that some people are actually excited about it? Good evening, I'm Leland Bitter. Once again, American businesses must face the prospect of possible shutdowns as COVID cases rise. Tonight, we're gonna to separate rising cases from rising risk for your family, for the vaccinated, and for the unvaccinated. Today, the U.S. government extended the U.S.-Mexico and U.S.-Canada border closure till next month, and they still haven't decided if visitors should have to show proof of vaccine. But maybe they should also show proof of insurance in case they end up hospitalized with COVID. Right now, California hospitals are as full as they were during the spring surge. It's noteworthy. Virtually everybody in those hospitals, especially in the ICUs, are unvaccinated. Joining us soon, a number of people intimately involved in these COVID trends. We want to start, though, with Brian Enton, who is outside a hospital in Miami. And Brian, we keep hearing over and over and over again from medical professionals, from the president of the United States, how important it is to be vaccinated. And what we're learning now is that there's still so many people who are not, including medical professionals themselves. Yeah, Leland, it's stunning uh, what we learned here. We're outside Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami. This is the big hospital with the most COVID patients. And the CEO says 42% of the hospital system staff are still not vaccinated. He says that they're trying to get that number down, but there's been misinformation going around and what he calls rumors going around the hospital system that have stopped some staff members from getting the vaccine. 40 plus percent. Is there any kind of discernible group who are not getting vaccinated and what are they doing to try to get those fo folks convinced? Well, you have to keep in mind there are almost 13,000 employees in this hospital system, so it's massive. And this statistics include uh, all the doctors and nurses and hospital staff, like techs uh, and the people who serve the food and everybody you can think of. We're told that most of the doctors and nurses are vaccinated, but in those other groups, uh, there are many, many people who are not vaccinated. And we were inside the ICU today with the nurses treating the COVID patients. All of this makes them very upset. Take a listen. Seeing this every day, working in this, is it frustrating knowing that there are other healthcare workers who aren't getting the vaccine? It is indeed. Indeed, because we have had very sick um, healthcare workers, they have not made it. It's sad to see people that you know being hospitalized. People you work with that are supposed to be really well educated on this, and because of some reason or another, they're not vaccinated. It's, it's sad. And pretty unbelievable, those nurses telling us that they have actually taken care of their co-workers sick with COVID inside the hospital's ICU, Leland. Yeah, you can imagine how difficult that would be for them. A any discussion of why the people who are not vaccinated, you said some of, some of the unvaccinated are doctors, not many, perhaps a little bit larger percentage are nurses. Is there a reason that is being given here? Well, specifically with the nurses, we heard two things. One uh, is that some of these nurses are worried about the reaction that they may have to the shot. And number two, we're told there are a number of nurses that are either pregnant uh, or are hoping to get pregnant and are concerned and say they just don't feel comfortable getting the vaccine right now. Fascinating. Uh, of the people who were in the ICU, obviously some of them are the people who work at the hospital, but there's a whole lot of people, I'm guessing, from greater Miami who are in that COVID ICU. Are any of the people in there vaccinated or is everybody unvaccinated? Yeah, this was striking to see. We were up there earlier. Every single person in the ICU is not vaccinated. Every single one. Uh, and there were young people. There was one young woman just 27 years old. Fascinating. Brian Enton there at Jack's Memorial Hospital, where once again, uh, they are on the front lines of this trying to save lives. And, and as we understand, there's so many of these people who, who if they had the vaccine, probably wouldn't be there uh, in the ICU. Brian, thank you very much. Great reporting as always. Uh, we head now to Dr. Joseph Lopato, a man with many talents in the medical field. This is a physician who cares for hospitalized patients, is a researcher and associate professor at UCLA. All right, uh, Doc, as we look at this and we keep hearing these numbers of surges and doubling of case counts and tripling of case counts, are, are those really the right numbers to be paying attention to? 
That's a great question, and they're not. Those numbers are really about the panic and the, you know, the hysteria and the hype that we've seen over the past year and a half. I mean, what really matters, what's always been the thing that matters, is whether people are getting sick and whether people are dying. Because there's, there's, it's just not possible to stop people from, from catching viruses. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fool's errand. Uh, so are we at the point to understand, in your esteemed medical uh, opinion, that if we're vaccinated, we go about our daily lives, and those that are unvaccinated have to sort of make a choice if they're willing to accept the risk of being unvaccinated, because it's going to be impossible to know if you've got vaccinated people who are asymptomatic carriers in the same way people walk around all the time during a cold season and have sniffly noses or maybe carrying cold viruses that their immune system uh, makes them asymptomatic to. You're absolutely right. You know, that's just how it is. That's what it means to be a human being. And these new rules that we've developed for COVID are extremely destructive. I mean, they're destructive for relationships. We've seen the damage that they've done to children and their development with school, the masks for, for kids. And um, I've seen, you know, many children who are fearful. And that's, you know, that's not what we want for our American children or children anywhere in the world. You know, children are supposed to be fearless. So it should be treated just as you described, you know, just like other um, other viruses that we live with and will continue to live with indefinitely. Well, living with indefinitely is scary. The fact that the vaccine works so well makes it makes it a lot better. Uh, this headline caught our attention. Uh, one of our competition. This is from CNN. Uh, more than 91 million live in U.S. counties with high COVID-19 infections. It's time to reset and put masks back on, experts say. Uh, directly contradictory to what you're saying, but it also seems as though that there is a, a desire by some in the medical profession to, to hype this to the point of continuing the pandemic and managing cases to zero. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely correct. And the mask pursuit, it really has taken more the shape of either, you know, a political crusade or almost a religious obsession. It, is, it should be obvious to anyone who's paid attention with all the mask mandates all over the country over the past year and a half, I mean, they, that they, were not, they were not significantly effective. What is effective? Immunity is effective. That's what's effective for, um, for stopping viruses and stopping illnesses. But the masks, at most, they have a modest impact on transmission epidemiology. I mean, that's quite obvious from the past year and a half. But you just can't get some people to yeah. quit their, you know, sort of obsession and it's, just faith it's the same and doc, just same deep time doc, and I've only got about masks. 30 seconds, so forgive the interruption. But back to Brian Enton's report that there are, there are a lot of young nurses down in Miami, and I'm sure at hospitals that you work at as well, who say they're not getting the vaccine out of, out of these fears of it's not been tested long enough in pregnant women. What about them? What are, what are they to do? Well, another, I mean, a real issue that's, I mean, it's, it's very important. So, you know, there are a few different things. We know that this, uh, this virus, it concentrates its harm in people who are older, yep. people who are obese. So there are, you know, we can't change anything about our age, but we can change something about how healthy we are. And the other thing that's been really overlooked during this whole pandemic to the detriment of the United States and people all around the country is early outpatient treatment. So there is evidence for things like hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, fluvoxamine, um, inhaled budesonide, now, especially when they're used early. But I, they've been politicized so people don't know they can be treated. Yeah, sadly, I was too healthy uh, at the time they thought uh, when I got COVID to get uh, the antibodies, the uh, Regeneron antibodies, ended up in the hospital myself with it. So uh, there are those cases. Mm -hmm. uh, Doc, we appreciate your expertise as well. And I know uh, nobody's looking forward to getting back to those days in the, the long days in the ICU. Dr. Ladapa, we appreciate it. Good to see you, sir. Okay, thanks. Thanks. And in Los Angeles, Chef Andrew Gruel, friend of the show, founder, executive chef at Slapfish Restaurant. It's an award-winning food truck turned international brick and mortar. They're based out of Huntington Beach, California. Uh, chef, throughout all of this, we have talked so many times. There have been closures. There have been reopenings. There have been plexiglass. There have been masks. There have been talk of vaccine passports. How worried are you now that there's this mask mandate in Los Angeles County and the talk about rising cases and hitting the reset button? How worried are you that you're going to have to be shut down again? 
Um, I'm confident we're going to be shut down again wow. in some way, whether it's just, you know, occupancy limits, whether it's, um, you know, the full shutdown. And I had mentioned this perhaps even the last time that we talked, I think I said, look, you know, part of the reason why a lot of people aren't coming back to work is because of the messaging coming out of places like Los Angeles or California in general is, is that, hey, look, you know, this thing, we're not clear through this, which perhaps we're not, but there really wasn't that positive notion of we can get back and we can manage our way through this. And I said, a lot of people aren't coming back into the workforce because they're afraid that they're going to get shut down again and then lose their unemployment benefits, which I totally understand, especially in an environment where the unemployment benefits have been misappropriated to some degree. So I think this right now is actually further amplifying that effect. And I'm seeing it on the ground level, uh, especially here from Los Angeles down into Southern California, Orange County. Yeah, we took a look at your Instagram earlier. Uh, first, it can make anybody hungry. I haven't had lunch, so I'm going to take a minute and salivate <laughs> over it. And it's, it's stunning uh, if you follow Chef Grill on Instagram how many times you're giving away meals to folks in need. And I'm wondering that as the talk of mask mandates comes back and as the fear comes back, uh, if you're seeing more people out there in California in need. Yeah, we are because a lot of people right now who are perhaps not necessarily getting back into the industry because of the fact that either the schools are closed and they stay home and watch their kids, they're not making as much as they could. You know, these unemployment benefits, I don't like the way that we vilified people and said, oh, they're just lazy, because that's really not the case. They're a bridge in many cases. And look, there's, of course, always your outlying circumstances, but a lot of people could be making more money and they could be advancing themselves more. And as we see prices rise and inflation take effect, some of these people are hurting. I mean, you know, we communicate uh, on the regular with people who are in need and we try and help out as many people as we can. And already the volume's being turned up a little bit wow. as I think people are starting to get nervous about shutdowns. We wanted to be live at one of your restaurants tonight and you said you had an event there. So it seems as though there, there are still people who are going out. Uh, is it like how it used to be yeah. that you had to wear masks as you walked into the restaurant and then you sat down? Have you had capacity restrictions yet? No, we in Orange County, we don't. So um, we are not wearing masks. There really aren't masks anywhere in Orange County okay. right now. But the cases are also incredibly low. And as you had mentioned, a lot the vaccination rates are higher. And those people who perhaps, at least in, in the people I talk to who aren't getting vaccinated, they're either at low risk or they have some level of natural immunity. Now, I'm not a doctor, but the reason I bring that up is, is that, you know, I think the fear doesn't necessarily have to be percolated to the level that it has. Yeah. And that's creating some unintended or intended consequences. That's what we just heard from the doctor earlier today. And it, it made it, you make a great point as it terms uh, of the vaccination right there. And I know you've talked about that and how much you've encouraged your employees to get vaccinations, but you're not going to check them. You're not going to make them check uh, those who are coming to the restaurant. Chef, we always appreciate your time. We know you're busy. Get back uh, and make Thank some you. money back there and uh, keep giving away food. It's, it's really <laughs> incredible what you're doing. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Leland. Thank, thanks for all you do. Household Republicans and conservative strongholds are facing pressure, not from the middle, but from the far right, especially when it comes to the 2022 midterms. We're going to walk over now to the touch screen. Right now, there is a 50-50 even split in the chamber. That gives Vice President Kamala Harris the final say on any vote. So roughly a third of all Senate seats are up for grabs. This happens every two years. And every seat is crucial. But in the current situation, well, is it abnormal or just sort of par for the course? All right, here's some of the people who are up. In Oklahoma, right here, reliably red state, Senator James Lankford, who rarely ever voted out of line with former President Trump. 90% in line is apparently not conservative enough because he certified the election results. Representatives Cheney and Gonzalez, Liz Cheney out of Wyoming, she was in the news again today, are targets of far-right challengers as they voted to impeach the former president. Governor Brian Kemp of Georgia, also a state this time that Joe Biden won has faced backlash for refusing to block Georgia's electoral votes. With that, we bring in Christus Soltis Anderson, pollster and columnist as well. Kristen, always good to see you. We appreciate you taking the time. I, I feel like there's a sense of deja vu of you always talk about the party in power. This would be the Democrats, perhaps, uh, experiencing challenges from their left in this case. But how rare is it for the party out of power to have somebody, uh, you know, you think about Arkansas and you think about Oklahoma, traditionally states where uh, senators wouldn't get primary, that you've got sitting senators primaried? 
Well, think about the last time you saw a lot of this happen on the Republican side. It was 2010. Republicans were out of power, and there was a lot of finger pointing and, and frustration within the party about why that had happened. And out of that came the Tea Party movement. And so you had a number of different instances across the country where folks who were really conservative further to the right challenged more establishment folks. But what's different this time around is that whether you are conservative or not actually isn't the most important factor. Um, as you noted, many of these Republicans who are facing challenges in their primaries are quite conservative in their voting record. They're not someone that's voting with Joe Biden an awful lot of the time in Congress. But instead, the more important axis uh, for these voters is, are you fighting? And for many of them, fighting means, did you fight for Donald Trump when it came to those election results? It seems as though Donald Trump matters so much in the American political landscape. Never before has a former president played such a large role after uh, he left office. Uh, Mike Allen from Axios was on with us in an exclusive interview on Monday night talking about his reporting that Democrats in the heartland are so worried about the far left of the Democratic Party when it comes to their races. Take a listen. You talk to Democrats and they'll tell you that they had two band-aids. One was Barack Obama, who transcended the usual Democratic message, and the other one was Donald Trump, who helped them. And I talked to Democrats today in preparation yeah. for this segment who said the only way they can keep the House is Donald Trump. They said that if he'll keep being out there with his message that elections are fixed, you shouldn't talk to pollsters, you shouldn't vote, that that is the one thing that can help them. So that may drive Democratic turnout. How important is President Trump going to be in the primary fights that we just talked about? Well, Donald Trump has a reasonably good record of being able to endorse folks in primaries. There are instances where his endorsed candidate didn't win, but usually it meant someone even further to the right or sort of an even closer inheritor of the Trump legacy wound up winning. You had instances, Congressman Madison Cawthorn from North Carolina, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert from Colorado. Both of them won seats in Congress, even though Donald Trump had endorsed their opponent in the primary. So his record's not perfect, but his influence is very strong. And I think the concern for Republicans is that if Donald Trump is a major presence, but he's not on the ballot, mm -hmm. he's not on the ballot in the way that you would be if you were president, do Republicans get all of the downsides of Donald Trump, meaning that activates Democrats, it turns off some of those swing voters, but they don't get any of the upsides, which is Donald Trump does turn out a lot of people who don't normally vote in elections. They're more disconnected from the political process, yeah. but they like him. So that's the trouble Republicans are in. Do they get all the downsides of Trump? but none of the upsides. Well, they learned that lesson pretty uh, abjectly in Georgia, didn't they? That's right. In Georgia, you had an instance where because Donald Trump had come out and said, look, I don't think these elections are working. I think there's fraud. There's a lot of real concern on the Republican side that that led to depressed voter turnout. Right. Um, that if a large piece of the Republican coalition thinks elections just aren't worth it, they aren't working anymore, do they even bother turning out to the ballot box? So that's the double-edged sword here of this kind of rhetoric coming from Trump is, on the one hand, he thinks it's activating and motivating his supporters. On the other hand, is it actually depressing them by making them think that Excellent. elections just don't count? Excellent point. Kristen Soltis Anderson, there's a reason we have you here. Thank you very much. Great, great perspective. Good to see you. Thank you. All right, coming up, his return to Earth has led to a space race controversy. So exactly how much did Jeff Bezos' joyride cost, not him, but you, the taxpayer? We have a very special guest here to break that down. Plus, checkmate. Russia has unveiled a new fighter jet, your first look, and what it means for the U.S. military. Big show tonight. We're going to take a look at the fabric of America and an in-depth look on why countries in peril often wave the American flag as a sign of freedom. New York Post columnist Carol Markowitz is here on that, as well as radio host and comedian Adam Carolla. Welcome back. Billionaires Branson and Bezos are battling it out in this new space race, but at what cost and to who? Senator Bernie Sanders says we, the American people, are the real losers in this whole thing. Check out his tweet. He said, am I supposed to be impressed that a billionaire went to space? Well, he's paid zero in federal income taxes some years. And the workers at his company struggle to afford their medical bills, rent, and food for their kids. Joining us now, feature editor of the Harvard Data Science Review, professor of data science at Washington University in St. Louis. She's also known as Mark and Carol Vittert's favorite child here with us. Liberty Vittert, nice to see you. We appreciate it. So, so who really is paying for this? Is this Bezos and Branson paying out of their own pocket, or is it the American taxpayers who 
are also footing some of the bill. Well, so in effect, it is the American taxpayers, because when Amazon uh, has only paid $3 billion in tax since 2013, and they should have been paying $14 billion, which gives us $11 billion to play around with, the American taxpayers could actually be paying for two of Jeff Bezos' flights up into space. Wow. Okay. And, and Bezos, in what is now being described as one of the most epically tone-deaf statements ever made on television, described it uh, this way. He kind of acknowledged it. Take a listen. And then I also I want to thank uh, every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer because you guys paid for all of this. <laughs> so seriously, for every Amazon customer out there and every Amazon employee, thank you from the bottom of my heart very much. Uh, it's very appreciated. <laughs> They paid for his cowboy hat, too. You may want to send that back. I don't know. But so where, where are we on this? Bezos is trying to regain his image. He did the interview with Anderson Cooper. He's donating $200 million. I'm sure he got a tax break for that as well. So where's he going with this? Well, I mean, the $200 million did go to some really nice charitable causes. But as you said, he gets a tax deduction for it. And it is also chump change in comparison to the federal tax that he personally should have paid over the past 10 years. So his effective tax rate since 2011 has been less than 1% in comparison to the 37% that most people in his tax bracket actually pay. Very good accountants. Uh most people don't want to pay more than they normally get to do in taxes. But put a perspective for us on what this money could have been used for. If you'd actually, even if you didn't pay the U.S. government, which you're able to write as big of a check as you want to the IRS, that's in the rules. You can do that whenever you feel like it. What could have all this money been used to, like if you wanted to, for example, take the money that he should have paid in taxes and give it to Amazon workers? Well, so we have $11 billion that he should have paid in taxes with, with Amazon, with a B. And to put that in a little bit of perspective, he could have cut a $22,000 check for every single U.S. Amazon employee, part-time or, like, full-time employed, right now with that money, which I think they might have appreciated a lot more than his thank you after his $5.5 billion 11-minute flight. Yeah, the sincerity of the thank you was in question, perhaps. It, this sort of begs, begs a, a bigger question. You've got Bernie Sanders, you've got Elizabeth Warren, a lot of the people on the progressive left who love to have, hate Jeff, Jeff Bezos. They love to talk about how low his effective tax rate is. He's just following the laws that all of these Democrats, or a number of these Democrats, uh, voted for. And it's no secret that uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, the rest of the progressive Dems all raise a lot of money in the Hamptons and in Palm Beach from the limousine liberals and in Nantucket uh, as well, those people love all the tax loopholes that allow these really low effective tax rates. Well, of course. So these progressive liberals need to write laws that make it so the ultra-rich can't take advantage of the system while the working people actually pay their fair share. But that would entail those same progressive liberals to put their money where their mouths are and stop filling their political coffers with this billionaire taxpayer loophole money, which I think we all know is probably not going to happen. Well, and it's also, in a way, it's pretty good investments for all of these limousine liberals because they make these donations. Uh, they show up at cocktail parties for $50,000 a head, and they get these tax breaks that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. It, it brings up another question, though, in terms of where this goes uh, from here, because the argument that Bezos and Branson make is that private space travel, private space exploration, and especially something like SpaceX of Elon Musk, lowers the cost of putting rockets into space for the Pentagon. You went to MIT, a lot of your old friends are working on these projects. Does it really lower the cost? I think we have a long way to go before it would truly lower the cost. And in effect, the American taxpayers are paying for it either way. So I think it's up to them which, which whether, one Whether is they'd better. like to send Jeff Bezos into space or more money, uh, money for NASA. Uh, Liberty, thank you very much. Follow her at Liberty Vitter and, and keep the comments nice. Mom reads them all, <laughs> Every uh, one especially of them. right now. Good to see you. Thank you. Coming up next, tensions are rising between Washington and Beijing over human rights and cybersecurity, but the administration, well, are they focused elsewhere? Plus this, the Olympics are a symbol of patriotism. But as America and the world remain divided, we are taking a closer look at what that means for the immigration debate. Don't forget, follow us on social media, at Leland Vitter, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. We're there.
Welcome back. This may not be on your radar, but it sure should be. There is some major new technology coming from our Russian adversaries. For example, this is their new fighter jet, and they have codenamed this jet Checkmate. Might not even be on the U.S. military radars either. Checkmate is the next generation of stealth fighter jets and reportedly can carry seven tons of weaponry, according to the Kremlin. The announcement of Checkmate came just one day after Russia's defense ministry tested a hypersonic missile in what they call the White Sea. Russia claims the missile can travel nine times the speed of sound, and on Monday it successfully hit a target 200 miles away. The Pentagon claims the Russian cruise missile could carry nukes and says the U.S. equivalents cannot. Russia has already threatened the United States not to deploy any hypersonic missiles in Europe, warning of what they call an inadvertent conflict. Those hypersonic missiles are also impossible to intercept. And then this, today, the Russians released footage of its new S-500 surface-to-air missile system. The S-500 system, codenamed Prometheus, is able to intercept ballistic cruise missiles as well as planes and helicopters within 400 miles. Russia says it's hoping to make that S-500 a best-selling export. You can imagine America's adversaries like Iran would certainly love to have it. So, with all of this military activity, the Defense Secretary, Lloyd Austin, and Joint Chiefs, of Cha Joint Chiefs Chairman General Mark Milley held a presser on U.S. relations with the Pacific allies. Reporters instead focused on grilling General Mark Milley following anonymously sourced reports that he worked to prevent former President Donald Trump from perpetrating a coup that there so far has been no evidence was ever planned back after the 2020 elections. They also questioned him on, quote, white rage. Take a listen. Were you concerned about the possibility of a coup and on what basis was that concern? Are you concerned that some of these comments that are attributed to you are making it, pulling you more into politics than you necessarily your, your office should be? Were you too political at the time? And are you concerned about the message that that sends to the rank and file? What led you to the conclusion of white rage? Hmm. Republican Congressman Mark Green, former Army Ranger, special operations flight surgeon, doctor, successful businessman, and now member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He is going to appear soon. There he is, as promised with us. Uh, Congressman, you and I both watched uh, that press conference with the chairman and the defense secretary. There was not one question about Russia. Yeah, that was startling. I think our media showed just how incompetent they are today, Leland. I mean, here you have the day after Russia unveils an F-35 competitor and puts in English the word checkmate on the side of it. The media is talking to the Secretary of Defense of the United States and they ask not a single question about Russia. Also this week, as you mentioned, the hypersonic missiles, which are nuclear capable. Russia said they were also nuclear capable. And again, they get no question from our ridiculous media. Uh, it, it's embarrassing. The cyber attacks from Russia, yeah. nothing what, about that either. What was, what was stunning to me also, though, is, is that uh, the secretary and the chairman didn't take the opportunity up there to even, even talk about Russia and address it on their own. Is the U.S. military complacent? For 30 years, we were we were sort of second to none in terms of military superiority. Doesn't seem that way anymore. It, well, clearly overmatch is a concern now. I mean, when I went to war back in 2003, uh, some uh, general officer and administration years prior to that had made the overmatch. It wasn't even a, a question. Uh, no one could compete with us. Nowadays, uh, Russia and China are advancing their militaries at a breakneck pace. You look at China's hypersonics, and chi China has the largest missile force in the world. Uh, they now have a larger navy than the United States. Yes, we, we should be talking about that, and the media should be asking those questions. Well, the only question that came on China was not from a U.S. publication. It was from a Japanese uh, publication, obviously. Uh, they have reasons to be a little bit more concerned and with China on the very top of their mind. I know you had yeah. dinner last night with the ambassador from Taiwan. They certainly have China uh, on their mind. How worried should the American people be about this? We absolutely need to be concerned. If you take a look at what China's been doing with Taiwan, over the last month, 
their incursions into Taiwanese airspace with military aircraft has been the highest that it's ever been in history. 28 times. In, the, in this calendar year, 100 times they've invaded intruded into Taiwan's airspace. So from a military standpoint, you got this bullying. And then on an economic standpoint, they actually stopped buying pineapple from, from Taiwan, a 90% 90% uh, of Taiwan's pineapple is sold to China. So it devastates their economy, those kinds of bullying actions. And they made up some story about critters in uh, Taiwan's pineapple supply, hmm. um, prompting Mike Pompeo to make a tweet, of course, about eating pineapple from Taiwan. But um, I like whether it's economic, whether it's political, whether it's military, um, they're bullying Taiwan, and we have to take this seriously. I, taking it seriously is the real question. You talked about China's Navy, and just a couple of weeks ago, I'm reading the headline from the Daily Mail. This is back July 13th. The United States Navy is, quote, in disarray and focusing more on diversity than war fighting. We also heard the questions uh, to the general uh, today about whether it was more important to be woke and about critical race theory. Is the U.S. military ready or are we complacent based on what you saw today? You know, I would say that we are ready just because of my contacts within the ranks of the military. But that report on the Navy was very damning. A three-star lieutenant general uh, from the Marine Corps and an admiral assessed that, and they basically said there's more diversity training than there is on how to pilot a ship. That is very concerning. Uh, and we have to, you know, after the Navy's incidents a few years ago, uh, this is a huge concern. Uh, and uh, it's unfortunate that that report um, you know, f had the findings that it did. We have got to, you know, my push on critical race theory is to stop, stop it. I've got bills here in Congress uh, preventing them from teaching it at the military academies. It, 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 critical race theory espouses that the way to fix past discrimination is to do more discrimination, which actually happens to be against the law in the United States. Yeah. So they're advocating for our military people to break the law. I mean, it's, it's insane. Real, real quick, though, in terms of uh, where, where these two issues intersect, uh, how, how are we to believe that the U.S. military does have its eye on the ball when you hear press conferences like you do today? We, we don't see the kind of rollouts of U.S. weapon systems in the, in the kind of propaganda. Is, is it a is it, are we just supposed to believe, uh, as Teddy Roosevelt would say, uh, the U.S. military is uh, speaking quietly and carrying a big stick because our carrier battle groups certainly aren't ar around the seven seas the way they used to be. Yeah, I'll compliment Milley on his answer to the China question. You know, his okay. ambiguity was appropriate. It's, it's not for him to get up there and tell the Japanese or, or the Chinese or whomever's asking the question exactly how many ships we have where. That, that, that's appropriate. Um, I will tell you that our drill downs from the uh, Armed Services Committee, when and I'm on the Armed Services Committee, I'm actually on the Readiness Subcommittee. The answers that we're getting are very good answers. Our military yeah. is as ready today. Uh, I'm more worried about tomorrow. You know, uh, Biden is cutting yeah. our defense budget four billion real dollars this year while increasing 16 percent. Uh, all the rest of the government spending. Uh, you can't sustain what we've got today if you continue wow. to cut the yeah, defense department's budget. It was just a headline right now from the, the Sun in the UK. U.S. risk losing drone superpower and uh, drone superiority. Uh, Congressman Mark Green, Republican from Tennessee. Appreciate it always. Good to see you, sir. Thanks, Leland. All the best. All right. Representative Green's not allowed to talk about confidential topics, top secret topics. So, if we scared you with all the Russian advancements, perhaps there's some things to make you feel a little bit better about in terms of American capabilities. He alluded to them later on tonight. We're going to show you the latest American advancements on the horizon, especially as it relates to stealth and being able to penetrate those Russian S-500 missile defense systems. Moving on now. The Summer Games in Tokyo are officially underway. Speaking of Japan, we want to take a look at the tradition of American exceptionalism at a time when the games continue to be steeped in controversy and politics. Carol Markowitz joins us now, columnist for the New York Post and also uh, an immigrant. Carol, we appreciate you being here. Thank it's you. fascinating to me. You immigrated from the USSR where uh, athletes certainly were not allowed uh, to disrespect the flag of the then Soviet Union. And I, I can't imagine what would happen to a Russian athlete who disrespected the flag of uh, Vladimir Putin if he got on the podium. Uh, does it make American exceptional if athletes turn their backs on the flag or not? 
Well, it's interesting because I think America is exceptional in more than one way in this way. Um, I think it's good that we are allowed to protest in any way that we want. Um, I also think it's good that Americans don't like it. I think that it's important that Americans say, no, we're not into this type of protesting where um, you're insulting us on the world stage and turning your back for the national anthem uh, and behaving like a child, really. Uh, so I, I, I like that it's acceptable or that, that it's legal and okay to do and you won't be taken away in the middle of the night and thrown in some secret prison. But I also like that Americans speak up and say, no, we, we're not into this. I wonder what the other athletes uh, think. I wonder what the people who, from where you escaped from, think when they yeah. see American athletes turning their back. And I know it's a special day for you because this is the anniversary of you coming to America. Yeah. Um, so every July 20th, my mother and I celebrate our, our arrival in America. And it's a, it is a really special day for us. We, it's bigger than the birth, our birthdays. Um, yeah. And it's a day that we really commemorate uh, how amazing it is and how lucky we were and how just blessed we are to be here and all the great things about America. And my column this week is about how uh, I think America is the greatest country that ever, that's ever been in the history of countries. And how do I pass along that kind of open, mm. easy patriotism to my kids who have never known anything but the freedom to be American and to criticize their country and to have people say, you know, bad things about it uh, yeah. in a really myopic way. So um, it's a challenge. You know, I, I heard from so many parents in the last two days that are worried about their kids being exposed to anti-American propaganda right. yeah, all over a, the place, there's a lot of it. including the Olympics. Yeah, there's a lot of it out there, and there, there's, a, there's a lot of it permitted now that just wasn't even a, a couple of years ago. Your piece is in the New York Post. It's something uh, that I would qualify as a must-read, and I'll take a little bit of editorial liberty and say uh, you're blessed to be in America, and we're blessed uh, to have you. Carol, thanks so much. So much. Thank you. All right, good to see you. Coming up, radio host Adam Carolla joins us to talk about the state of education in America and exactly what Mark Green was chatting about, critical race theory, when we come back. Welcome back. The Biden administration says it was, quote, an error to promote the abolitionist teaching network's handbook that pushes staff, and we're quoting now, to disrupt whiteness and oppression. Joining us tonight, familiar voice, Adam Carolla. He's a comedian and host of the daily podcast, The Adam Carolla Show. Uh, Adam, you are outspoken on the issue of education. What does this say about the Department of Education that put this out in the first place? Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, your stepmom found a joint underneath your pillow and you go, oh, that wasn't my joint. But it's like, well, all right. But Did you ever who have you that experience? With? And, Did you ever have that experience? It seems like you may be speaking from personal experience with the stepmom and the joint. Well, if you replace uh, pillow with car ashtray and you replace joint with heroin syringe then yeah okay so okay had the same there we go happen. so so you don't you you're not buying the the administration saying oh gee we don't endorse this even though we told people to do it no i i don't and i don't even know why we want the federal government dictating to schools what the curriculum is i mean shouldn't there be you know, state and local city municipalities. Like, I, I, I don't get why we want the federal government mandating everything in our society. It just seems like that's all they want is bigger and bigger government, more and more uh, mandates. And get them while they're young and coach them up and create good little citizens so they can think like you and vote like you later on in life. One thing you talk about, one thing that we're not teaching much of in, in schools these days is, is values and discipline. And I know you're out in California. This is video that you tweeted out of a, a number of what appear to be kids, uh, based on just looking at the video, taking the, the five-finger or ten-finger discount, as you might say, in, in department stores. They're just walking out with armfuls of clothes, and nobody's doing a thing. And I think you pointed out the police aren't going to do a thing either. Is there is there a link between what we're teaching in schools and what we're seeing on Instagram? Well, first off, this abolitionist teachers group should be labeled a hate group. I mean, if you, if you read anything about their charter, 
they're really a hate group, this sort of thing where racism can only go one direction, which is white on black or white on Hispanic or straight on gay, is ridiculous. Hate is hate. You can be, um, you can, you can be a hateful group and have a different skin color than the founding fathers. And you, know, you have all these groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center that are constantly looking at everyone, trying to label them as a hate group, like my friend Dan Dennis Prager, Prager U. They're on the Southern Poverty Law Center group. Why not police your own Southern Poverty Law Center? Oh, yeah, this is a they, yeah, hate they, group. Well, the, the, they, it's interesting how the Southern Poverty Law Center, which I, I used to spend money to send money to them because of the work they did in shutting down the Klan, um, how much they've changed uh, and sort of lost their way from, from where it was founded in the, in the good work they did in the past. I, I'm just interested in this video because you tweeted it out about these kids walking out with all these handfuls of, of merchandise. Seems like we're going to keep seeing that, right? Well, I mean, there's consequences. There used to be consequences. So we used to yeah, discipline kids, kids yeah, at school. You can't, you can't discipline the kids at school anymore, so they don't learn discipline. They don't learn consequences. And then we've removed a lot of the consequences from society. So, you know, we've defunded the police. The cops have stepped back. They said, I'm not going to get involved with this. The stores hire a security guard, but the security guard can't do anything right. because the yeah, store doesn't gonna... want to get sued. So everyone just steps back. But the real victim is not the store, and it's not the people who shop at the store. Yeah. It's the people we let get away with this crap right. at such a young age. We essentially ruin their life. The victim is the kid that's not being suspended for acting out at school. Right. That's where they get it wrong. Yeah, they well, the, the, you, the you, make, you make a good point, and especially after the pandemic, how many kids have lost uh, these valuable years? Uh, Adam, we're going to have to leave it there. And uh, we'll be right back with a look at a special guest for tomorrow night's show. Tomorrow night, we have adult entertainer Brandi Love. She's a vocal conservative, and she was kicked out of a conservative free speech conference simply because of what she does for a living. There's a lot of questions on this, including whether Republicans are now involved in cancel culture of their own. In terms of new U.S. weapon systems that we promised to show you, we'll do that tomorrow night. I'll see you then. Robin Marney are next.